Hey Ian. So I've been reading this book on permaculture by David Holmgren, and it's gotten me thinking a lot about the relationship between theory and practice. Holmgren describes a practice, permaculture, a, a practice about agriculture, or perhaps more broadly, it's a practice about human development. But he also describes a number of theories. There's two kinds of theories I want to focus on right now, evolutionary theory and then also spiritual religious theories. In chapter two, Holmgren devotes a few paragraphs to permaculture and spirituality, and he basically says that while the potential synergy between permaculture and spiritual practice is quite high, there's definitely a lot of overlap, he personally feels unsure about how to proceed in that direction. And likewise, Holmgren often speaks about the scientific nature of permaculture, but his ecological and evolutionary knowledge just really are not robust enough to back up his claims in a way that I find satisfying, at least. Um, but I think that we can pick up his slack in both the scientific and the spiritual realm and make points that Holmgren is not prepared to make. I had a good thought just now about the relationship between permaculture and evolutionary theory, and I was thinking and thinking, and then I realized that in order to explain it, I'd have to do quite a bit of exposition first. So this is going to be a long video. We're already a minute and a half in. Uh, but bear with me, please? Um, <laughs> I don't know. If you want to read along as I talk, there's a link to the script that I'm using in the description. So yeah, let's talk about permaculture and evolutionary theory and religion. Let's talk about religion first. So in his four volume epic, The Masks of God by Joseph Campbell, which is essentially an evolutionary history of mythology, Campbell puts forward a thesis about the function of religion throughout history. The thesis says that religion has two broad functions, personal and public. And it seems to me that in the past, the personal and the public functions of religion were far better integrated than they are today. We can describe these two functions in another way. Uh, we can say that the personal religion is concerned with what is, and the public religion is concerned with what ought. So to make that a little clearer, the public ought religion asks things like, what actions ought you take in the public world? Whereas the personal is religion asks, what is your personal experience of the world? What, what do you experience? Right? And so the public ought religion asks, what is the right thing to do, the moral thing to do? Whereas the personal is religion asks, what are you? What is reality? And are they the same thing? Is your reality you? So the texts and practices of all of the ancient religions address both of these concerns often quite synergistically. For example, the Abrahamic faiths teach us that there is a supreme Lord and that what one ought to do is obey his commands. The Buddha, in contrast, taught that life is suffering and what we ought to do is meditate and give up attachment in response. But those two examples are too simple, so here's a more sophisticated one. The Hindu tradition speaks of the four ashramas, or life stages. The word ashram comes from the Sanskrit word shrama, which means to toil. So ashram literally means untoil. Each ashrama has a name, so brahmacharya is springtime, the young phase, the student phase. It's when you're still learning about the world and how it works. Then comes grihastha, summertime, it's when you get married, and it's time to watch the seeds you planted when you were younger begin to grow and to invest in the future. Next comes varnapastha, autumn, it's the phase where you reap the benefits of all your hard work and then begin to teach yourself to not care so much about material wealth. And then in the last phase, sannyasa, you renounce everything and devote all of your time to contemplation of Brahman. Then, the story goes, comes moksha. You're released from your toils and you merge with the timeless universe. The majority of the ashrama concept, then, is concerned with the public ought function of religion, right? It maps your life into four stages and tells you what you ought to do in each one. Learn, then get married, then have a career. But the ashramas also contain some very powerful tacit statements about what is. Notably, they claim that life is a process of development. Life is an unfolding towards the ultimate direction of comprehending Brahman. They claim that this comprehension of Brahman is personal. It's best attempted only after the oughts of your life have been completed, 
and it's possible to withdraw into the private world of the self. You can't withdraw into the private world when you have all of these familial obligations. So this tradition tells us what we ought to do, you know, live your life in this order, but importantly, it also tells us how to integrate all of those oughts into our understanding of ourselves and integrate it into our understanding of what reality is. Okay, so I think it's essential that the systems of thought that we use to guide our lives, systems of thought that we use to guide our lives is another word for religion, I think it's essential that these systems of thought, they tell us both what is and also what we ought to do in an integrated way. I think that the problems of modern society stem from a really deep and profound disconnect between, between what we know the world is and what we are told we ought to do within it. Here's what I mean. Over the last 300 years or so, the personal is function of religion has been slowly taken over by modern science, and then very quickly taken over by modern science, with mixed results. In the is part of this realm, science has done jaw-droppingly well. We know that the universe is made of fundamental particles, fermions and bosons, which obey the four fundamental laws, gravity, electromagnetism, strong, weak, etc., etc. But for the personal part of this realm, science has failed utterly. Knowledge that fermions exist tells me nothing about what my essential nature is. Likewise, for the last 300 years or so, the public ought function of religion has been taken over more and more by capitalism and government policy, and again with mixed results. The average human on Earth is arguably both richer and more free than a human of the past because secular capitalism tells us what we ought to do to promote these things. Get a job, vote, etc., etc. But, but secular capitalism tells us very little about the public part of the public ought function of religion. We're encouraged to treat the individuals around us more like economic agents than human beings, and likewise, we're encouraged to treat the Earth more like a resource to monopolize than like a home. So this, finally, brings me to the point that I wanted to make about permaculture and evolutionary theory. They're currently segregated disciplines, but they shouldn't be. They need each other. They need each other because theories about how to live, that is, religions, are most effective when their is function and their ought function are integrated. Permaculture tells us what we ought to do. It's a system of design principles for guiding action and growth in the world. But while permaculture might give us good advice on what to do in the world, it does not seek to explain in any grand sense what the world that we are doing the things in actually is. And by grand sense, I don't just mean a theoretical sense, although theory is a huge part of it. I also mean a cosmological sense. I mean a grand story, a myth, a myth about who we are and where we came from and our place in the world and where we're headed. I believe that evolutionary theory can provide this myth. It tells us who we are and where we came from. We're primates. We evolved from a single-celled ancestor. And maybe, Maybe, just maybe, evolutionary theory can also tell us where we're headed, too. The details of this myth will take centuries to work out, but I'm going to try to give you an outline now. Ready? Okay, here's how the outline goes. We started as a single organism, and to a single organism we shall return. Luca, our last universal common ancestor, was a single, solitary cell swimming in a chaotic, primordial sea. Gaia, the god we are becoming, is a whole planet unified as a single living organism, still swimming in that same, now cosmic, primordial sea. On the way, there are some important pit stops like endosymbiosis or multicellularity or the evolution of agriculture, but the grand myth will be the same as it has always been. It says once we were whole and to wholeness, we shall return. Let me say that now in less mythological language that might be easier. I believe that permaculture is a system for interacting with the world that will allow us to live and embody a theoretical point. 
theoretical point that human society is becoming an integrated organism, a unit of selection in a rigorous Darwinian sense. Furthermore, I believe that integrating evolutionary theory into permaculture will not just make its practices stronger, it will also make them far more meaningful. If we can say that we are all the same organism, all of a sudden the reason for doing these permacultural practices stops being just practical and also starts being numinous. And the numinous is motivating. So this is the work we have to do. It's our job to describe in detail how theoretical knowledge of natural selection and niche construction and organismality can not just inform but also improve our permacultural practices. And likewise, it's our job to describe in detail the evolutionary function of religion in human society and to reintegrate that function into the way that we relate to each other and into the way that we relate to the ecosystem we live within. Because this is what I believe permaculture is striving to be. Permaculture is striving to be an integrated system which tells us not just how to relate to ourselves, but also how to relate to the world. All right, that's all for now. Thank you so, so much for listening. <laughs>